people have, because it's dangerous. Um, high mortality, because lots of people die um, over here. They're taking big risks, so why would people go? And, um, and face the unknown. And we call things that, that drive immigration and movement push and pull factors. Push factors are things that push you out. They're generally bad. All right, the potato famine in Ireland in the 1840s is a push factor. It pushes the Irish out. There's nothing to eat. They're starving. Okay, pull factors that pull you in and are generally good things. Um, opportunity. All right, uh, the chance to better your position in the world. Social mobility. Right, the, uh, to change your class, all right, your wealth and your status. We're going to pull people to the new world. All right, so um, some of the things that send people out, this is the population increase in Europe. We have overpopulation, no jobs, um, no available land. All right, so they need to um, seek opportunity elsewhere. All right, you know, we're still in a gray area. We're agricultural society. The wealth is measured in land. And since there's no opportunity to have any land, um, people have to go somewhere else for it. On the enclosure movements going on in Britain, uh, Ireland, and Scotland, that's when the landlords realize that they can make more money with sheep than they can with people. So they send some big guys around at night or, or all day, and they, uh, they knock on their tenants' doors, and they, they say, you have to leave now, and they knock your house down and send you packing. So there's people flooding um, the cities out of the country with no jobs, no opportunity, and they'll be willing to leave and start over. Uh, Religion is going to be a, mo a big mo motivator. The Re Reformation, which we'll talk about a little bit, classes is still in full swing and challenges to traditional religious or accepted religious thought lead people to look for places they can practice their beliefs in peace. Okay, so that will be mo mo religious freedom, a big one. Okay. Um, primogeniture is the policy of the system where the eldest son inherits everything. So if I have four sons and two daughters, uh, when I go, only my eldest son gets anything. Everybody else has to go. Do, do something else. They're out. All right. So that's going to lead to uh, people seeking opportunity elsewhere. Um, the dollar motivation. Again, land is wealth, and if you can get yourself to the new world, there's a chance you're going to get at least 58 acres of land, which is a lot. So there's opportunity to be had here. A second chance for criminals. Um, we'll talk about this specifically in Georgia uh, for debtors, all right? So a place to start over and get a second chance in, in, in life, okay? So we've discussed that push and pull factors, reasons people leave. Now, nations um, are going to take different approaches. They're going to have different strategies in how they go about getting people over here and establishing colonies and what the nation's role is in the, um, in the, in the colony. Right. In the new world, we talk mostly about four um, different colonizers. Um, the Spanish, <clears throat> uh, the French, the English, and uh, the Dutch. Okay? Now, Portugal's down in Brazil, but it doesn't really affect us in this course at all. Um, the Dutch are going to be in New York. New York is, a, is a, originally a Dutch colony. Okay, um, Different methods they take. Um, the Spanish take a, a direct approach, government sponsors where they um, directly fund colonization. The problem with this is if something goes wrong, they directly lose those funds also. Um, so it's an expensive approach and a, a risky one. And we'll see it kind of strangle um, the Spanish Empire. And we'll discuss that briefly also in the past. England's going to utilize the joint stock company. Um, that allows um, stock is a share in a company to buy stock. So you buy ownership in a company, you can only lose your investment whatever the stock cost. So that allows um, them to raise more money um, to more people, all right, and, and uh, finance big ventures. So England, uh, when we get to Jamestown, Jamestown settled as a joint stock company, the Virginia Company of London. I think the initial share of the Virginia Company was somewhere around about $60 in today's money. All right. Um, it, it spreads out the risk. It's a much safer um, approach to the risk and the um, the French are going to establish trading posts. Um, they come over in much fewer numbers. Um, uh, and, and what's important about this or to remember, they come over in fewer numbers, so they're going to get along much better with the Native Americans than other um, European powers. Remember that they love to ask that on the SOL. It's a kind of trivia they like. All right? So the French get along better with Native Americans, and it makes sense. They come over in less numbers. They need to get along better. 
um, missions to Spanish, the Catholic Spanish, also established missions, um, religious settlements to uh, the American Southwest and, and Mexico. Uh, a famous one you may have heard of is the Alamo. Again, we'll go into that in more detail in class. Okay. We have characteristics of settlement. Now, we're going to start off with um, two early colonies now before we go into the characteristics of the three big regions. Okay. Jamestown is the first permanent English settlement uh, in the New World. The permanent means lasting. So it's not the first attempt. There was a, an attempt at Roanoke and I, Roanoke Island, that failed earlier on. And you may be familiar with it when they came to restock it. They found the word Croatoa carved in the tree. That's all they found left of the, of the colony. So Jamestown is the first permanent settlement, English settlement, in the New World. Jamestown, like the rest of the South, the main motivator is going to be economic opportunity. Okay, people came to make money. It's established by a company, the Virginia Company of Loan. So the main um, motivator for the South, and Jamestown particularly, is economic opportunity. It's founded in 1607, again by the Virginia Company of London. So if I say on a test, who settled Jamestown or who founded Jamestown? You don't want to say John Smith or John Arnold. You want to say the Virginia Company of London founded Jamestown as a business venture. It's given a charter um, by the king, which is a document granting them legal rights to establish and form this colony. Um, I've also promised them the rights of the Englishmen very, very important. So the colonists who come from the time of Jamestown to the time of the Revolution consider themselves Englishmen and understand their rights as Englishmen, and that those rights are very important to them, okay? 1619, we're going to get the first Africans imported to work on tobacco farms, and also we'll have the establishment of the Virginia um, House of Burgesses, which will be the first um, example of representative de democracy in the new world. Um, and today it's the Virginia General Assembly is still lasting. We're we'll going to discuss why here we have representative democracy in the South and up north in New England they're going to have direct democracy. Um, and there's geographical reasons where we'll go in. In the South people live on big plantations. Plantations are big farms and we're all spread out. So you can't leave your job or your plantation whenever need be to go participate. So we sent somebody to represent us, which will lead to um, the people that have the time and money um, to go and spend time with Williamsburg being in charge of the General Assembly. So we'll see the wealthier class take control of the General Assembly by the House of Burgesses. Um, okay, some important vocab and names, John Smith. Um, He's one of the men that saves the colony when, when they first get to Jamestown. Again, these are things we're going to expand on in class. He, um, he said, if you don't work, you don't eat. So he forced the colonists, uh, the, the townsmen and the wealthy who came to search for gold and stuff to get off their butts and go out and plant and, and work and ensure the survival of the colony. Uh, John Rolfe, maybe in a bigger way, saved the colony because he discovers a way for the colony to make money. If he hadn't messed around with different strands of tobacco to get a viable strain that could be commercially sold, uh, Jamestown would have failed. Right? It's a business venture. If that business can't make money, the company and people back home in England are going to stop sending supplies, stop sending people, and stop supporting the colony. So Rolf saves it through the um, development of tobacco. Cavaliers, uh, UVA, the seller, remember, uh, over on that side of the mountain, there are people who know the king, made friends with the king, and they got large land grants, huge land grants from the king. Okay. And then indentured servants. Indentured servants, if we look at uh, early why people came, you, you bought, or you kicked off your farm, right? you were a tenant, um, your brother inherited the land. Most of the people that came over early on were poor, poor and couldn't afford um, the journey, so they would sign a contract um, uh, to work for somebody for seven years in return for past job. Okay, so an indentured servant couldn't afford to pay his own way forward. He would sign a contract work for seven years, and at the end of that seven years, he would get 50 acres of land uh, for his service. All right, um, in New England, um, and we'll start off with Plymouth in New England first, is settled for religious freedom. All right, 
And now, when we say religious freedom, it's for themselves, no one else. Okay, the first colonists and early on the colonies of in New England are very, very intolerant of any other religious thought but their own. All right. Um, so while it's religious freedom, sure, just for them. Okay. Uh, the first group over the Pilgrims. Um, they're going to land in Plymouth about 1620, so 13 years after the Jamestown settled. They actually land in Plymouth. It's part of the Virginia colony. They were coming to Virginia, so um, they realized where they were. And they said, you know, this isn't so bad. It's far enough away from, from Jamestown and, and the Virginia colony itself that they can't bother us and help us with do every time. So we'll stay right here. All right. Um, so again, they're, they're pilgrims. Pilgrims are a group of Puritans. Um, which is part of the Anglican Church, the Church of England, okay, who thought the church was still too Catholic. Again, this is during the Reformation. They were forming the church, attacking Catholicism. So they didn't like the changes that the Anglicans had made, and they wanted to separate from it. So the, the pilgrims then are separatists. All right, um, the pilgrims came over on the Mayflower, and before they even got off the boat, as the Mayflower pulls up to Plymouth Rock, the men get together, and um, decide um, the rules or how they're going to rule their colony, and they they write the Mayflower Compact. Um, the Mayflower Compact is, is a promise that all the men on the Mayflower, the people on Mayflower, will obey the laws and respect the laws that they make for their community. All right. Uh, the Puritans then come later, not long after. Uh, they want to purify the Anglican Church, not separate from it. Okay, improve the Church of England. Um, they practiced direct democracy in town hall meetings and established a covenant community. A covenant community is a um, the idea or a community based on the principles of the Mayflower Compact and Puritan religious beliefs. So in New England, there will be no separation of church and state. Okay? You're standing in the community and politically depends on your standing in the church and you being a participant in that church. All right, now the type of democracy formed in the different regions, as I said earlier, has a lot to do with geography. In the South, people were spread out living on large plantations. They elected representatives, that's representative democracy, to make laws for them. In New England, the soil was very poor, very rocky. So people didn't live on big farms. They practiced what we call subsistence farming. You just grow enough for your family and yourself. So they lived close together in towns. And since you live in towns, you have the opportunity to participate directly or went down to town hall and voted. The men, the men, church members in good standing, voted on the rules and laws for their community. That's direct democracy. Um, and sometimes we refer to that as Athenian democracy from Athens, Greece. Okay. On um, the middle colonies, um, we'll see as a um, combination. And as we go deeper into the colonies over the next few shows, you'll notice this. All right, they're a blending of the two regions. That makes sense. They lie between them, they're in the middle, and they'll blend in and get done. Kind of pick and choose the best of both of the others. All right, they're much more religiously diverse. They're much more, there's much more economic opportunity um, in their towns, in their cities, and, and, which, and we'll see a much, um, maybe more different ethnicities, ethnic groups, uh, English, Irish, German. All right, much more, uh, many more people different parts of Europe, the Dutch, okay? All right, so we then just have to look a quickly at the uh, effects of colonization, and we're going to go into the 13 colonies in much more detail over the next couple of shows. Um, we're going to see worldwide commercial expansion. Again, that's trade, all right? Agriculture.